الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رحمة للعالمين We begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and asking Allah to send His peace and blessings upon the final Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and all those who follow his way with righteousness until the last day. Today's topic is on Surah Al-Kahf, the 18th Surah in the Qur'an, uh, which is found directly in the middle of the Qur'an. This is the, uh, in terms of the actual side of the Qur'an, this is the middle part of the Qur'an. Uh, chapter number 18 and it's a very important surah because it is directly linked to the day of Juma. it is directly linked to Friday uh, many of us are unaware of this but there's a very important sunnah a very important practice that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has emphasized that we do on the day of Juma. and I'm hoping that through this uh, short discussion I will be able to motivate you to revive the sunnah in your life and that sunnah is the recitation of Surah Al-Kahf every single Friday. This is something which is established in the authentic hadith. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has stated that Surah Al-Kahf serves as a light from one Jum'ah to the next. Right, this is an authentic hadith. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stated that Surah Al-Kahf serves as a nur, as a light from one Jum'ah to the next. In order to understand this hadith, we need to understand the usage of the word nur or light in the Qur'an and hadith. The word nur or light is very often in the Qur'an and hadith used as a metaphor to mean guidance. For example, the Qur'an is described as nur, meaning the Qur'an is a means of guidance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes himself as nur samawati wal ard, the light of the heavens and earth. And many of the mufassirin say this means that all of the guidance that is found on heaven and earth comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so throughout the Quran and Sunnah, you will find this usage of the word nur to mean light and to mean guidance. So in this hadith, we take it in the same meaning, that the recitation of Surah Al-Kahf from one Friday to the next is a means of guidance for you. This means that if you spend your, if you take out time on Friday and it takes between 20 to 25 minutes if you're reading slowly. And for those of you who read a bit faster, it takes about 10 to 15 minutes every Friday to recite Surah Al-Kahf. If you do this one practice every Friday, this Surah will guide your actions for the next week. So this is a sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Many of us are not aware of the sunnah. It is something we need to revive in our lives, in the lives of our families. That every single Friday we should take our time to recite Surah Al-Kaf and to reflect upon its meanings and lessons. And that is what we are going to do today. Today we are going to look at the main message of Surah Al-Kaf. What is this surah about, and how can we implement its main message in our lives? Surah Al-Kahf is a, to give a bit of background, it's a Makkan Surah. It was revealed in Makkah. And from amongst the unique characteristics of the Makkan Surahs is that they tend to focus on our beliefs and on stories. And this is exactly what you find throughout Surah Al-Kahf. It's beliefs, story, story, beliefs, story, story, beliefs. The whole, so- the whole Surah is just made up of stories and beliefs. And the stories themselves are stories of things we haven't seen, so we have to believe in them. So it's also a matter of belief. So the whole surah is a surah of beliefs. And it revolves around a central theme related to our beliefs. And that is our belief about this world. You see, many people out there, they wonder, why does this world exist? What's the point of this world? Why are we here? What's going on on earth? And what am I supposed to do with the next 60 years of my life? Why are we on earth? Now, <clears throat> in other Juma khutbahs, you may have learned about why we exist, right? Allah tells us in the Quran, He created us to worship Him. But why does the earth exist? Why does the earth exist? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers this question in the beginning of Surah Al-Kahf. Verse number 8 And in the beginning of Surah Mulk Verse number 2 Allah says in Surah Ka That He has made Everything on earth Beautiful To test which of you 
will do the best deeds. And then he will reduce everything on earth to nothing. Meaning, this earth exists solely as a temporary test. The, this whole earth is a test. And like any other test, it has a deadline. It has a finish point where it will end. And then all that matters after that test is over, after this earth is over, all that matters are your beliefs and your deeds. That's all going to matter when this earth ends. So in these two verses, Allah is reminding us that this world is temporary. It's going to end. Without question, every person you know, including yourself, is going to end. Everything you know is going to end. Every empire will end, every country will end, every superpower will end. You will end, I will end, this whole world will end. All that is left after that is our souls. And our souls will be judged on the day of judgment according to their beliefs and their deeds. In Surah Mulk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the same message at the very beginning of the Surah. Where He says He created death and life to test which of you are going to do the best deeds. Again, notice that in these verses Allah focuses on the quality of our deeds, not the quantity. Allah does not say He created the earth to see who is going to do the most deeds. It's who's going to do the best deeds. The quality of our ibadah is even more important than the quantity of our ibadah. Meaning, someone who prays two rakats of the hajjud, and he cries his eyes out to Allah, and he connects with Allah in those two rakats, his two rakats of the hajjud have more value in the eyes of Allah than someone who prayed the whole night and did not affect the iman or heart in any way. Because the quality of the ibadah is even more important than the quantity. So getting into the main theme of the surah. We said the surah is about the test of life. Now what's interesting about the surah is it's made up of stories. The entire surah is story upon story. And there are four stories told in details in the surah. And a fourth story that is hinted at in the surah but told in details elsewhere in the Quran. And the scholars of tafsir have explained that each of these stories teaches us about one of the tests of life. And when we understand all of these stories, we understand all of the multitude of ways in which we are tested in life. So the four stories that make up the essence of Surah Al-Kahf is number one, the story of Al-Kahf. Kahf means the cave, the story of the people of the cave. This is the longest story in Surah Al-Kahf, the one that is told in the most details, the one that the Surah is named after, and it is the one which contains the most important lesson about the most important test we will face in life. After the story is over, another story begins, a parable about two men and a garden. When that story is over, there is a reminder about a story told elsewhere in the Quran. The story of Adam and Shaitan. It's not mentioned in Surah Al-Kaf in details, it's just one verse, verse 50, where Allah reminds us that Shaitan is our enemy. And then, two more stories are told in details at the very end of the Surah. The story of Musa and Al-Khidr, and the story of Zul Qarnay. Now these four stories each focus on people being tested in a different way. And when you understand these four tests, you know what to prepare for in life and you are able to deal with the test that you are going to face in the upcoming week. Because make no doubt, about, have no doubt about this. Our lives are a test. If you are not being tested in one way, you are being tested in another way. In the store, in the surah, what's amazing is, is there's a test that looks like a test followed by a test that does not look like a test. And then again and then again. What do I mean by this? The people of the cave were kicked out of their city. They were driven into exile. Anybody can agree that's a test, right? The next story is about a guy who gets very, very rich. And he doesn't realize that getting very rich is a test. This is followed by a story where a lot of bad things happen. A ship is broken, a, a child is killed. It's a story we can see this is a test. We've been tested here. And then that's followed by a story where Dhul Karnayn, a righteous leader, takes over many countries. That's a good thing, but what we don't realize is that good thing, just like the man who earned a lot of money, this good thing is also a test. And so this, the surah balances it out. It shows us one test that looks negative, so we know it's a test, and then it reminds us that there are also tests that seem positive, but we must not forget that they are tests in life. 
So even wealth and power and success are tests. And this is a major theme throughout the surah. So let's get started because we only have about 20 minutes to go through each of these stories. So I will try to spend 5 minutes on each story. The first story is the story of the people of the cave. Uh, this story is something which was known to the Arabs of Makkah. And what had happened according to some of the hadith narrations, they wanted to test if Prophet Muhammad wasallam was a true prophet or not. So they asked the Jews to give them some questions that only a true prophet will be able to answer. And some trick questions. So they came up with three questions. Tell us details about the soul, about the, the ruh, the soul. That was the first question. The second question, tell us the story of the people of the cave. And the third question was, tell us the story of Dhul Qarnay. And so, Surah 17 and 18 were revealed answering these questions. Surah 17 answers the question about the soul. And that was a trick question because the Jews told the Arabs that a true prophet will tell you that only Allah knows about the soul. So this is how we're going to catch him out that he's not a real prophet. So what was revealed in Surah Al-Isra? They ask you about the soul, tell them the soul in a matter of Allah and you only know a little bit about it. That's what Allah revealed. First test passed. The people of the cave, many different versions of the story circulated amongst the Christian and pagan and Jewish communities right until today. Right until today, if you read the Christian history books, there's a variety of different versions of the story in circulation. The Quran came and clarified and gave the correct version of the story. And it begins with the verse that we are going to narrate to you the true story. And in Zul Qarnayn, the story is mentioned at the end of the surah as well. So the people of the cave, basically, the story is about something that happened about 200 or 300 years before the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where... There was a community of Arabs where people used to worship idols, right? Which at that point in time was the norm in Arab society. People were worshipping idols. And in the society, there were seven young people who began to think for themselves. And many of the Mufassirin say these seven young people were from the upper class of society. They were wealthy businessmen, they were uh, princes, they were people who were like, you know, they had a good life. But they... As often happens even in the world today, when people have a good life and they don't have Allah, they feel empty. They start to look for something more. And that's what these seven young boys said. They began to look for purpose, they began to look for meaning, they began to look for why do they exist. And all seven of them individually came to the same conclusion. That these idols are wrong and there's only one God and we need to worship Him. And so the seven of them met and they became friends and they bonded over this belief in what Allah but now, the community turned against them. And again, this is something which happens all too often today. Where if you have a community that all agree upon a belief, no matter how wrong that belief is, and a young person comes forward and tells them they are wrong, what happens to that young person? He's finished, right? The community destroys him. And so that's what they try to do to these seven young boys. They threaten to stone them to death. So they had no choice but to go into exile. But they had a problem. Every community around them were idol worshippers. They could not find a single community of worshippers of Allah. Right? They could not find a single community of worshippers of Allah. So they had no choice but to find a place to hide. So they chose a cave. They said if they go into a cave, they at least they are hidden from society. They can then figure out what to do next. So these young boys, they went to the cave. They took the guard dog with them, they sit the, the dog guarding the entrance of the cage to make sure no one comes looking for them. They sat down and they said, now what do we do? And then they realized that at this point in time, there is nothing we can physically do. So when there's nothing that you can physically do, what do you do? You make dua. So they made dua, they asked Allah, they asked Allah to solve their problem for them. And Allah solved their problem with a miracle. And this story is an evidence that miracles do not only happen to prophets. A miracle can happen to anyone whom Allah wills for it to happen to. This story is clear evidence of that. Because these seven young boys, there is consensus that none of them were prophets of Allah. But a miracle happened to them. What was this miracle? Allah put them to sleep for 300 years. And when they woke up 300 years later, they were still exactly the same. When they woke up, they thought they just slept for one day, or they slept for one and a half days. So basically, they were transported 300 years into the future. Why? Because 300 years later, that same city 
was now a city of believers. So the problem was solved. The problem was solved. They were living in a time when the city was full of disbelievers. Allah put them to sleep and woke them up in a time when the city was full of believers. So now they didn't have to run, they didn't have to hide, they didn't have to spend their lives in the cave. So what the story teaches us, you know, the, the, the core lessons of the story, and if you go into details about it, but just sticking to the theme, the core lesson of the story related to this world being a test is that the number one thing Allah will test us about in life is how true we are to our faith. Do we really believe? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the beginning of Surah Al-Anqabut that do you think that you can just say I believe and you will not be tested? No, you will definitely be tested just like those before you were tested. And so this is the first lesson of Surah al kaf that we will throughout our lives be tested about our faith. Do you really believe in Qadr? Do you really believe in Allah? Do you really believe that Prophet Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah? Do you truly believe in the existence of angels and jinn? All of your beliefs will be tested. And the true believer will come out from that test with even stronger faith. Look at the people of the cave. When they were in the cave, they didn't say, you know what, uh, we, we stuck in this cave, if God was real, He would have helped us take over the city. They didn't say anything like that. They, their faith got stronger. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the this, in this surah that He increased their faith through this test. The more they were tested, the more their faith in Allah increased. It's not like today. Many people today, you know, we have a crisis of people leaving Islam. When you ask them, why did you leave Islam? Oh, my, my Molana used to hit me when I was small. Allah never helped me, so maybe Allah is not real. But only one thing happens in your life when you don't want to believe Allah is real. How do you come to that conclusion? Have we, not, have we not been taught that life is a test? Maybe the help is going to come later. Maybe it's going to come in a different form. Maybe that happens so you can learn not to be like that Mulana who hit you. It be some, it, there's many other possibilities besides God doesn't exist. But this is what people think. So the first test is our faith. You will be tested about your faith. You will be tested with non-Muslims telling you your prophet was like this and your prophet was like that and he had so many wives and he fought wars. That's a test to your faith. If you truly believe, that's not going to affect your faith. You will be tested with people saying Muslims are terrorists. People telling you, shave your beard, don't have a beard. People telling you that, you know, you are a terrorist. If you dress like that, you're never going to be able to travel the world. You're never going to be successful in business. It's up to you to pass that test by being firm upon your faith no matter what the world shows at you. And when tests come, when things go wrong, that's not a reason to lose faith. That's simply affirmation that the Qur'an is true. Because what did the Qur'an promise? The Qur'an did not promise us that if you believe life will be rosy, life will be Jannah, you get everything you want. That's not what the Qur'an promises. The Qur'an promises if you believe, we will definitely test you. There's a double emphasis on the verb here. We will definitely, definitely test you with fear and hunger and loss of life and loss of wealth. It is a promise of Allah that we will be tested. So when the test comes, that should increase our faith, not decrease it. So that's the first lesson. The people of the cave were tested in their faith. They remained firm. Allah gave them a miracle and helped them solve their problems. Our lesson from that is every day we will be tested in our faith. We must find ways to remain firm. By praying our salah, by reciting Quran, by increasing our knowledge, by keeping good company. These are things that increase our faith no matter how bad things get. Now coming to the second story. Now the second story, there's difference of opinion amongst the Mufassirun as to whether this is a true story or a parable. Right? There are some scholars who say this is a true story that happened amongst Bani Israel. There are some say it happened amongst the Sahaba. And the others who say that this story is a parable. It's an it's a example, a metaphor. And that's the opinion I, I agree with because of the wording of the verse. Allah begins the verse by saying, Give them the example of two men. Right? That's how the verse is worded. The word masal is used, which means a metaphor. So Allah knows best, but that seems to be the case about the story. That this story is a metaphor. So what is the metaphor? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that imagine there's a man who's very wealthy. He, he's a farmer. He's got this farm that every single year without fail, he makes a profit. Every single year. And his neighbor is also a farmer, but he's not doing too well. So the wealthy man is always boasting to the other guy and he's always telling him, I've got more money than you, I've got more people than you, I'm stronger than you, I'm better than you. 
And his neighbor warns him, his neighbor tells him, when you are successful, you should say, Masha Allah la quwata illa billah. Meaning you must attribute your success to Allah, not to yourself. And he said, if you keep boasting, Allah may take your money away and give it to me. And the story ends with exactly that happening. That at the end of the day, the farmer who was boasting, Allah destroyed the entire farm with a flood, and eventually the other person became wealthy instead. So it's a very short story. It makes up just a few verses in the, in, in the surah. But the lesson is very relevant to our time. We said that the first story of Surah Al-Kaf teaches us that we will be tested regarding our belief, our iman. The second story of Surah Al-Kaf teaches us that we will be tested regarding wealth and money. And the Prophet ﷺ feared this test for the Ummah. He feared that this is, this is what's going to really get to the Ummah. He didn't fear that many Muslims losing their faith. Alhamdulillah, there's still you know, billion, over a billion Muslims in the world. What he really feared was when Muslims get hold of money, they lose their moral compass. Capitalism, materialism, selling the deen for dunya, this is the real fear. And this is what many of us are experiencing today. Many of us don't realize that money and wealth and success and profits, all of this is a test from Allah. On the day of judgment, Allah is not going to ask you how much you earn. He's going to ask you two questions. How did you earn it? How did you spend it? And this is the test of life. That we spend every working day, because working is wajib. On a man, to work and provide for your family is wajib. It is compulsory upon you to do so. So we're going to work every day of our lives. But we're going to work with this intention. I'm going to earn halal, I'm going to spend halal. So on the day of judgment, my balance sheet is okay inside of Allah. The other part of this test is not letting success and wealth get to our heads. So what did this man do? You know, the, the verses in the surah is really uh, amazing that this man, he became so wealthy with his farm. Do you know what he said? He said, I don't think there's an afterlife, but if there is an afterlife, I'm going to Jannah anyway. Have you ever heard such an arrogant thought? I don't believe in the afterlife, but if it exists, I'm going to paradise. And you know what's the funny thing? I've heard atheists say the same thing today. I've, I've heard atheists say the same thing. They say, I don't believe in afterlife, but if it exists, I better go to paradise because I'm a good person. You know what this is? This is the essence of arrogance. Where you don't want to believe in paradise, you don't want to work for paradise, you don't want to do the deeds of the people of paradise, but you feel entitled to paradise. A sense of entitlement. This is not the way of the believer. A believer is humble. A believer never thinks, I'm definitely going to paradise. Rather, the believer spends his entire life between hope and fear. Hoping that Allah forgives his sins and fearing that Allah might punish him for his sins. In between, somewhere in the middle, finding the balance. Don't ever feel that I'm definitely going to Jannah. And many people think, many people think, you know, I'm wealthy because Allah loves me. You're not wealthy because Allah loves you. Donald Trump is wealthy. You think Allah loves him? You think that's how it works? You think that's the measurement of, of who Allah loves? How much wealth you have? That's not how it works. And some people think the opposite. Some people think I'm poor because Allah loves me. That's not how it works as well. Many of the worst people on earth are poor. Many of the criminals are poor. Wealth and poverty, either way, is not a measurement of whether Allah loves you or not. It's your belief and the quality of your deeds. And wealth itself can be a means of going to Jannah if you spend it in a way that is pleasing to Allah. So the second lesson of this surah is that our wealth, whether you have it or not, both ways, it's a test from Allah. If you don't have wealth, Allah is testing your sabr. Allah is testing your patience. Are you going to steal? Are you going to get involved in haram business? Or are you going to be patient and ethical and work your way up the right way? It's a test from Allah. If you have wealth, Allah is testing you. Are you going to become arrogant? Are you going to become materialistic? Are you going to forget Allah? Or are you going to use that wealth to help the ummah? This is the test. Towards the end of the surah, there's two more stories. And the first of these two more stories is the story of uh, Prophet Musa alayhi salam and his meeting with Al-Khidr. And this is again a very long story, a very important story. In fact, I think we should do an entire Juma lecture just on this story because there are so many lessons from it, but more than that, there are so many misconceptions in our community based on the story. That we have a lot of misconceptions about who Khidr is and what he is 
and beliefs that we've extracted from that. So maybe one day, inshallah, we can go into more details on that story. But to put it very simply, Prophet Musa alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had informed him that there was another Prophet in his time who had knowledge that he did not have. So Prophet Musa alayhi salam, he wanted to meet this Prophet. So he and his uh, his student, uh, Prophet Yusha alayhi salam, who wasn't a Prophet yet at that time, the two of them embarked on a very long journey to meet this individual. And this individual was the Prophet Khidr alayhi salam. And when they met Khidr, uh, Musa accompanied him on a journey to, to learn from him. But Khidr had a very strange condition. Khidr's condition was that, you can travel with me as long as you don't ask me any questions. Whatever I do, don't ask about it. Because I, I want to do some strange things. So Musa al Islam thought and maybe he could handle that, but he found himself unable to do so. And basically he asked three questions and Khidr decided that that's it, that's the end of our journey together. So what happened was, they started a journey, they needed a lift across the river. So a poor family with a, with a boat was going past and gave them a lift on their boat across the river for free. Khidr then took an axe and damaged the ship, damaged the boat. And Musa al-Islam got really angry. Like, These guys are helping us out for free and you're damaging their boat. And Khidr reminded him, you're not supposed to ask any questions. Later on, Khidr literally killed a young man. He literally killed a young man. And Musa al-Islam, obviously being the man of justice and piety that he was, he couldn't just accept that without asking a question. Right? So he asked him, how can you commit a major sin like that? And so Khidr said, that you're not supposed to ask questions, I'll explain to you later. And the third thing that happened was, they came to a city full of terrible people. And these terrible people refused to host them, refused to take care of them. And so, Khidr fixed one of their walls that was breaking for free. He just fixed the wall and he carried on. So Musa Islam said, these people are not treating us well. You could have at least asked them to, to pay you some money for fixing their wall. So Khidr said, this is it. You know, you're asking too many questions. Let me explain to you what I did. Khidr was a prophet of Allah. And everything he did was based on the wahi, the revelation of Allah. So the rules that apply to a prophet are different from the rules that apply to the average person. Right? So what did he do? He said those people with that boat, there was a king going past, who was basically hijacking and stealing the boats of everybody he saw. So I damaged the boat, so they had to take it out of the water and repay it, and by the time they get it back on the water, the king is gone, and they still have the boat. It's better they have a boat that's damaged, they have no boat at all. He said, as for that boy, Allah revealed to me, Allah revealed to me that that boy was going to grow up to be a tyrant. A tyrant. And his parents had made dua for a righteous child. So Allah commanded me to take that child's life and he was going to bless them with a better child later on in life. And he said, as for that wall, but underneath that wall was a treasure that was the inheritance of two orphan boys. And their father was a righteous man. If that wall had collapsed, those evil people of that city, they would have stolen the entire treasure. So I fixed the wall to deprive those evil people of that treasure. So when those boys are old enough, they can dig it up and take it for themselves. Now this story, how does it fit in with the main theme? There's too many lessons from the story, we can't go into it. But just with the main theme of today's talk, the test of life. The test of life that this story teaches us is that sometimes bad things happen to good people and we don't know why. And sometimes good things happen to bad people and we don't know why. But all of it is according to the qadr and wisdom of Allah and we must learn to trust that. Your car broke down and you ended up missing a meeting because you're repairing your car. Maybe Allah made that happen so nobody hijacks you on the road. Maybe the car got on the road will got hijacked. You don't know. Allah knows. Everything happens for a reason. We must firmly believe that everything that is beyond our control happens for a reason. A loved one passes away, it happens for a reason. Something of yours breaks, it happens for a reason. And the third part of the story, sometimes it looks like a good thing is happening to a bad person. But it's not. It looks like these evil people, their wall got repaired for free. It looks like something good happened to bad people, right? But actually, they were being denied the treasure. So it was not as good as it seemed. So we have to trust Allah, that Allah knows best. Now Allah gives power to whom He wills, He gives wealth to whom He wills, He makes people the presidents and kings of whom He wills. He 
puts tests into our lives as he will. Some of us are orphans, some of us are wealthy, some of us are poor, some of us come from privileged backgrounds, some of us don't. Each of us have different tests. We have to trust Allah. But Allah knows what is best for each of us. And Allah will test each of us according to what is going to grow us and make us into the best people we can be. So if we live our lives trusting Allah's wisdom, trusting Allah's qadr, no matter what happens in life, we'll be able to react to it in a positive way. And this is the third test, that you will be tested with things you don't understand. You will be tested with things happening in your life that you cannot say I understand why it happened. Sometimes you just can't. You just can't understand why somebody died, why a tsunami took place, why a flood took place. Only Allah knows why it happened. And you just have to trust that Allah knows best. Now we come to the final story. The final story is mentioned very briefly. It's the story of Dhul Qarnayn. And to summarize it very simply, Dhul Qarnayn was a Muslim ruler who Allah gave power to over entire nations in the East and West. He was the most powerful ruler of his time. And the most important and relevant passage in the story to our team is at the very beginning, where Allah gives Dhul Qarnayn power. He asks him a question. He tells him, Oh Dhul Qarnayn, you have power over all these people. Are you going to be nice to them? Or harsh to them. And Zul Qarnayn's reply is profound. Zul Qarnayn's reply teaches us how to deal with the test of power and authority. Zul Qarnayn said, From all these people who have, I have power over, if any of them are criminals, I will punish them. As for everybody else, I'll treat them well. I'll be just to them. This teaches us justice. Justice does not mean you treat everybody the same. Justice does not mean that you are a pushover. You know, that you're in a position of power and people can do whatever they want to you and people can disobey you and people can, you know, get away with crime. That's not what handling power properly means. Dhul Qarnayn teaches us how to handle power properly. And that is, if someone is not doing their role properly, they should be, according to justice, given the appropriate punishment. And everybody else, everybody else should be given freedom and justice. And so the test that we learn from this specific story is that each and every one of us in some way or another, at some point in our life or another, are tested with power. We are tested with power. You may say, but I'm never going to be king or president. Yes, but you have authority over your wife. Ladies, you have authority over your children. Some of you have authority over your son-in-laws and daughter-in-laws. You have authority over your domestic workers. You have authority over your employees. Are you being just to them? Is the way you're treating your spouse some a way that's pleasing to Allah? The way you treat your children, are you being fair and just amongst them? Are you playing favorites? Something you'll be answerable to Allah on the day of judgment for. Your domestic workers, are you treating them properly? Or are you being racist and tyrannical towards them? These are the tests of power in our daily life. And the only way to deal with these tests of power properly is to follow the methodology of Lukarni. That yes, when someone is out of line, we use our power to bring about justice. But otherwise, we treat people nicely. Right? That, that's the middle way. Uh, if you are running a business... If you treat everybody harshly, no one's going to want, want to work for you. If you treat everybody nice all the time, no one's going to do their work because they know they can get away with anything. But if you are nice to people, but you fire those who don't do their work, you're going to have the best team ever because people know that you're nice to them as long as their work's getting done. That's justice, that's the middle way. That's what the story teaches us. So to summarize, Surah al teaches us that life is a test. And through its four stories, it teaches us that each of us will be tested with four things. Allah will test your iman. He will test your belief. How true you are to your faith. Allah will test you regarding money. By either taking it away or giving it to you. Or both at different points in your life. And see how you react to these different situations. Allah will test you with things happening in your life that you cannot understand. And how you deal with and react to those situations is how, whether you will pass that test or not. Whether you accept the qadr of Allah or you question Allah, that is a, how you pass that test or not. And finally, Allah will test you with power and authority over someone or the other. Will you be just to them or not? These are the four tests of life. 
So I end with a reminder that the recitation of Surah Al-Kaf on the day of Jum'ah is a sunnah. In our community it has become a forgotten sunnah. Let us revive the sunnah. Let us make time before coming to Jum'ah or at least before Maghrib on, on, on the day of Jum'ah to sit and it will take you 15 to 20 minutes to sit and recite Surah Al-Kaf and to reflect on his lessons. The Prophet wasallam stated that Surah Al-Kaf serves as a light, a means of guidance from one Jum'ah to the next. This is an authentic hadith. So let us practice on this hadith. Let us take the Surah, understand it, implement it in our lives, live our lives accordingly, and revive the Sunnah of reciting it on the day of Jum'ah. Wa'akhir da'wana, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa